Hello everybody and welcome to uh, the week four hangout for the Animal Behaviour and Welfare MOOC. I'm beginning to lose track of the weeks. This week was Down on the Farm or Production Animal Welfare. So I'm sure you remember the lovely Fritha Langford Hello. from uh, the Dairy Cow Lectures and Susan Jarvis from Hi. the Pig Welfare Lectures and uh, me, who you've seen all the time. Uh, so yes, we're going to go through the Google Hangout and I'm sure you know the format by now, but if we have anyone new who's joining us, we're gonna be answering some questions from the forums and then you yourselves can be answering questions using the question and answers app. And I'd just like to remind you, if you think these Hangouts are interesting and useful and you enjoy watching them and you're doing it on YouTube, please remember to like, share and subscribe these videos because then YouTube will suggest our videos to other people and the message will get out to more and more people. So do remember, if you're enjoying these, like, share and subscribe. So, with all that in mind, how are we enjoying the course this week? Well, I think this week's been great, really. Yeah. I've really enjoyed the discussion boards. We've had lots of interaction with uh, all of the students. Um, some great posts, some really interesting posts, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of the questions today yeah. in so, more detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the, the posts, obviously, people are, are reading in depth and they're investigating before they post, mm -hmm. and, and also I quite like the fact that people are, are challenging us quite a lot and I asking us difficult yeah. questions. Yeah. So that's good. That's what being a scientist is, is all about, really, and we're used to that kind of mm. questioning. So I think it's for me, it's quite eye opening sometimes because there are things which we take for granted, like mm -hmm. the male trick question, which comes up, mm -hmm. is seems very obvious to us, I think but then obviously not necessarily quite so obvious for you guys. So what questions do we want to start with? Um, I think we were going to kick off with, I guess, um, how animal welfare science can kind of contribute and what its role is. Mm -hmm. um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about um, people's choices in terms of what they eat um, and also thinking a little bit about global food demand. Mm -hmm and um, meat production and animal welfare within those systems. And a, a little bit, I suppose, of, of asking us um, why we're not more involved in trying to influence, for example, people's choices in, in, in whether they eat meat and in trying to influence global meat production. So I think we wanted to start off with just clarifying the sort of what we think the role of animal welfare science is. I think I posted in one of my posts that we're scientists, not campaigners. What we are trying to do is provide objective scientific evidence about particular practices or environments or results of breeding technologies or whatever the, the, the question may be, what the impact of that is on the animal um, from an animal welfare perspective. And obviously, as you know, we use lots of different measures to try and assess that. So um, what we are really trying to do is provide the evidence. How that evidence is then used, well, that can be used in, in a very, uh, various um, ways. It can be used for um, NGOs or whatever to develop their campaigns. It can feed into legislation. It can feed into the way that um, retailers, the retailers demands on their suppliers. They might demand particular ways in which animals are kept and that may be based on scientific evidence. So to give a couple of examples um, of that, um, for example, research done actually here by Alistair Lawrence looking at the development of oral stereotypy in pregnant sows, which you know are also, as well as being confined um, historically and, well, currently throughout the rest of the world, in gestation stalls, in combination with food restriction, develop um, um, oral stereotypy. And there was quite a lot of research at that, um, on that particular topic. And that contributed to um, the ban of the use of the gestation stall for pregnant sows within the EU. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how our animal welfare science can translate into legislation. And I think Fifth is going to mention the... Yeah. the well, poetry. absolutely. So another pers person posted on one of the discussions about whether we are um, interested in maintaining the, the status quo, I suppose, and, and mm. working with the, within the production industries too much. Uh, some, some people thought mm. that maybe we were doing that, mm. but we're absolutely not interested in maintaining the uh, status quo if there is evidence and that we find evidence to say that the status quo isn't good for animal welfare. Um, and one of those examples, again, and has been shown to uh, change over time, is looking at the um, furnished cage for laying hens, so and the, ba the barren battery cage. So back in the 1980s, um, people started to do science on understand, well actually it was the 70s, uh, Marion Dawkins did mm. a, a great study on whether 
birds would choose to be in a battery cage or not. And bear in mind that was the 1970s, so uh, at the time we didn't know very much about animal welfare science, it wasn't really a developed discipline at all, um, and yet we could start developing the evidence that the battery cage really wasn't very good for hens because it didn't offer all the different types of behaviours that hens like to do, um, but it did provide uh, housing and it did provide um, the removal of the birds from their droppings, so it reduced parasitism and things like that. Mm. So there were good points about a battery cage, but also an awful lot of bad points from the hen's welfare point of view. So as the science has increased over the years and we've been working towards developing systems that are better, and of course that was um, uh, productive in, in producing this uh, ban of the bar bar barren battery cage in the EU, which occurred in 2013. It took quite a long time to persuade all the producers that they really, really did need to give up their barren battery cages. Unfortunately, some of those barren battery cages have been mm. sold elsewhere around the world, so that's not necessarily a very good thing. But now you have the furnished cage in lots of cases, but an awful lot of other producers actually went to uh, more um, non-cage based type of system. So they went from a cage system to a barn system or a free range system, which obviously offers a lot more in terms of the animal's ability to carry out its natural behaviours. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things to take from the uh, the barren cage story with hens. And that's firstly, the length of time that it took from years. the first sort of scientific question of, mm. is this what hens want? Uh, to getting the public to be aware of that and there was a little bit of a perfect storm there of uh, riding on the back of Ruth Harrison's animal machines um, the salmonella crisis in the UK mm -hmm. with eggs uh, so there was a perfect storm which enabled the public to get very interested in this and, and curious then the science being um, formally and widely distributed to policymakers mm -hmm. and the policymakers and the consumers both then doing the same thing and it's only in 2013 that we actually start to see the real benefits of this so I know I kind of say I, I, I feel like I say it both ways and sometimes I'm saying that you know we've been doing this science for a long time and we have but in other respects it does take a long time for all of this to filter through to actually make a difference in the real world. And bear in mind there was a 10 year lead into that ban. So mm -hmm. producers knew yeah. 10 years prior to the actual ban being in place that they needed to get rid of their barren battery cages. Yeah. And also if we look at what's happening in the States just now, there's the Prop 2 legislation issues that are going around in different states. And uh, various states are trying to increase the size of the barren battery cage, not put anything in it, but just increase the size. And they're all doing it at different sizes mm. for the same type of hen. And it's not evidence-based, or some of it's on evidence-based, but doesn't really go far enough probably to provide reasonable yeah. welfare for those hens. So um, it's quite interesting how it works slightly differently from the EU to the US. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I can, you can see where animal welfare science has slotted in there, and it slots in with Jill's absolutely right, with public concern, with uh, pressure groups, um, and with obviously government policy as well. So yeah, yeah. all those things have to be in place in some ways um, to achieve uh, the, the full ban. It probably has to have everything. Because if you just have I a piece so. of evidence, then, then maybe the government wouldn't move necessarily forward. Yeah, and, and often uh, some animal welfare science, the actual research is carried out because the government has received lots and lots of comments and concerns from the public about a particular issue mm -hmm. so that then becomes a higher priority for them to fund the research to try yeah. and, um, and answer the question. I think that's something uh, to recognise as well when um, animal welfare scientists are taking money from industry to research things it's because the government and the policymakers aren't funding us so we're either funded by the policymakers, which means there has to be enough public interest to make that a funding priority, or we're, we're funded by the charities who are funding us because there's enough public interest to be donating money mm -hmm. to give that money over. Uh, and those are very usually quite small pots of research money. Uh, or it's money contributed through industry, such as I think I mentioned in an earlier hangout, my PhD was part industry funded, as an example. And you can see in all of my papers that came from my PhD, we, we fully acknowledge that it was an industry partnership. Um, and there's information available about that on request. 
but that industry funding is there because the government doesn't want to be the sole funder of these kind of research, mm -hmm. at least in the UK. Um, so it's a very complex picture, I would say. I think as well, the industry funding, that can either come from the actual producers or large production companies, mm -hmm. but increasingly as well, retailers mm -hmm. are, um, you know, they're commissioning research because they are, they're getting much, much better at predicting what might come along in terms of legislation, things that uh, the public are concerned about. Obviously, they want to market their products. Mm -hmm. So if they can, um, you know, um, commission research to answer particular questions relevant to them, that they might pass that on to the, 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 the suppliers who then have to meet the criteria mm. of, of the particular retailer. And also just probably a final point on that, that um, it's a very small amount of uh, fun, of, of science and welfare science in the UK and in Europe I think at mm. least is funded by industry so yeah. it's yeah. around about 90% that's funded by government yeah. either the national government or the EU um, within the EU and so uh, you know it's a very very small amount that's actually funded yeah. by industry the huge majority is funded by yeah government. I'm quite happy to explain the breakdown of my PhD as an example so if you looked at any documentation you would see that my PhD firmly states several times that there was industry funding. That industry funding was equivalent to um, £3,000 uh, over a three-year PhD, which is not a large contribution. Uh, a contribution to labour, uh, so in the sense of we had some people helping us from the company, and a contribution uh, in supplies, so they gave us uh, some, uh, some free hardware to use. That's, that's the kind of uh, industry contribution that we're talking about a lot of the times. But because, I think sometimes because we are very quick to acknowledge that, people sometimes think it may be more than it is. But anyway, yeah. Should I answer this with the maternal behaviour stuff? Oh yeah, so should we go on yeah. to this one? So uh, this is a question from Elizabeth Throckmorton. And Elizabeth says, a friend in vet school heard from a professor that a cow's mothering instinct has been bred out of them. Is this true? And is this too broad of a statement? Yeah. It goes hand in hand with quite a lot of the other questions we've yeah. had about mothers and or about breeding in general. So yeah. do you want to head off yeah. with that? Yeah, well we had, I think it was Jonathan had posted about some experimental work on, on sheep and maternal behaviour and lamb mortality and so on. Mm. And I think, I don't want to touch on that specifically, but I think as a general point about how we deal with maternal behaviour within production systems, um, there's... Obviously, the, the, the process of maternal behaviour, we get variation within a population and how maternal um, individuals are uh, within a natural you know, population. And then obviously, when we bring them into a, a production system and through domestication, we've altered their maternal behaviour. But a lot of that influence has been via the use of uh, management systems or particular types of environment. So, for example, if you take the case of um, the well, well, let's well, let's I guess touch on dairy cows first. Then maybe you want to contribute here, Fitha. But mm -hmm. obviously, the dairy cow um, spends very, very little time with her calf. Um, now that has consequences. We know from a lot of early experience work that that can have consequences on the development of the calf mm -hmm. and how likely she is to perform well as as a as a mother herself. And if we indiscriminately just or just select any female from the population to take through to the next generation, then we're not selecting specifically for maternal behaviour. And therefore that can have a generally a detrimental effect on the quality of maternal behaviour that those animals then express. Similarly, in the pig, we've see, you've seen the videos about the farrowing crate system. One of the big issues with um, pig production is, is piglet mortality and the crushing of, of piglets by the sow. So what we have done over the last few decades is we've bred pigs in a, in a restrictive environment in which we protect the piglets from the sow by the actual physical environment. But what that means is that we're not selecting on maternal behaviour. They may be very poor or good mothers, but because we're using the environment to restrict their maternal behaviour, we don't actually see which ones are good or bad mothers. And that may all be well when you're in a farrowing crate, but now with our increasing sort of desire to give um, farrowing sows more space, if you then try and put these animals into an open space where there's less protection for the piglets, 
we start to have implications on piglet welfare by increasing piglet mortality. Mm -hmm. So we really need to focus in on selecting um, animals for their maternal behaviour which suit the environment in which we're going to keep them and to, to stop using environment and management to almost mask the differences in maternal behaviour between individuals. Obviously the other issue which was, was raised by Jonathan was, was sheep and there's much more intensive management of sheep um, around lambing. So there's much more human intervention actually the parturition process doesn't happen naturally often. The lambs are, are, are actually taken out of the ewe, uh, she's penned up with the lambs, um, and so any variation in maternal behaviour is kind of lost in the whole management system. So then how do you select which ones are good mothers and which ones are poor mothers to take on to the next generation or to, to use again? So we really are masking that variation in maternal behaviour by environment and management. And if we want to improve maternal behaviour in our farm species, then we need to allow them to express that. Just on the specific point of whether cows have been bred out of being yeah. good mothers, I don't think there's any good evidence that that's the case, to be honest, because uh, there's been quite a few studies that have looked at um, keeping the calf for longer periods of time than just the six hours or the 12 hours that's standard across uh, industry. And in those cases, the mothers manage perfectly well. We've also all probably have anecdotes if you're um, in dairy farms where a cow has given birth in the field rather than being in the maternity unit. And they're always the ones, if they've managed to look after their calf for a little while, they're always the ones that are the most difficult to, yeah. to remove the yeah. calf because they are bonded. Because yeah. That's what happens in nature. Eh? So it's really the removal of the, the cow and calf at such an early point that reduces the bond, of course. Um, and of course, then the cow is, is milked. So um, the hormonal uh, problems that would be there if the calf had been taken away and then nobody was taking the milk from the animal um, are not there. So she, she does get feedback from being milked. She does get an oxytocin um, release from, from having been milked. Um, so there are some of the sort of endogenous parts mm. of the, the pathways of, of missing your calf mm. aren't going to be there because um, she is being milked, of course. Mm. Whereas if there was nothing being milking her, then she wouldn't have that hormonal side. They do go and look for their calves. But they, yeah, yeah. so calves are often taken into a different building, often for calf health reasons, which mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Um, but the, the, you do see cows standing mm -hmm. at the gates mooing for their, for their calf. I guess there's, a, there's another aspect to maternal behaviour, I think, which is quite interesting, which is, of course, maternal defence of the offspring. Mm -hmm. And this is where we can sometimes get into conflict with management because what you want, really, ideally, is particularly if you're using, for example, beef, beef cows would be out on pasture in a sort of more free-ranging situation um, that ideally what you want is a cow who's going to protect her calf if the calf is threatened. Um, so you want um, animals in particular situations to display really good maternal behaviour. So in the beef industry, that's been probably more of a priority in any of the other industries we've, we've mentioned. Similarly in pigs, if they were in a free-ranging system or a larger um, system, then again, you want them to be defensive of their offspring. But that comes into conflict with handling because you, you try and either handle the, the calf or the piglets or you need to treat the, the cow or the, or the sow. It can become very, very dangerous for the handler. Um, so on the one hand, you want the beef cow who's out on the hill to be defensive of her offspring. But when you have to catch the calf to tag it, to identify it, then you can then end up with a conflict with stock person safety. Um, so how that will all pan out in the future, we, there has been some interest in this about maternal defensiveness, but handleability mm -hmm. and whether we can perhaps achieve both um, without them being in, in conflict. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think that's probably the maternal aspects mm -hmm. done. Shall we uh, go to the next question? There's uh, some, some from our list. I really liked that one. I yes. Would, yes. I would really yeah. like so the terminology that. one. So we had a really good question right at the beginning of the Hangout list on uh, terminology. So I can't remember the name of the person. I can tell you. Okie dokie. 
It, Megan, Megan. Megan. Yes. So Megan said that she was really interested by some of the terminology we're using, which of course is mostly farm jargon, uh, where we use things like growing of animals rather mm. than maybe raising or rearing, where we use the term accommodation, the place yeah. where the animals live, and even the term milk parlour, uh, where the cows go and get milked. Now, these are all terms that are used throughout farming industry, um, so it's not something that we are imposing upon them, it's more that we use the same words as they do, but of course they give interesting connotations, don't they? So the growing makes you think perhaps, as, as Megan says, that it's something that, that, that happens, you're not, you're not having to um, raise them in a, in a mothering type of way, so yeah. this goes back to our issue about maternal mm. behaviour. Um, so we, we use the term growing, which could be more used for plants, say. We also use the term crop, by the way, mm. uh, sometimes for uh, a crop of lambs, for example, mm. which is what the farmer will use when those lambs go off to slaughter. That's their crop of lambs. So um, it's very mm. similar sort of terminology to as you would use for plant type farming. Um, the accommodation, so Megan said, you know, you're, you're saying that it sounds very luxurious, that it's like a hotel <laughs> environment. Yeah. We also say that we put furniture yeah. inside a cage it's furnished a furnished cage, cage system so um again we think well you know is that saying that it's very luxurious that the mm -hmm. hens have got a sofa to sit down yeah. on <laughs> it's all very nice um so perhaps we should think about our language more carefully as to mm. to whether um we are making it sound nicer than it really is i think we definitely are and there's been there, there is research um and those who are more familiar with the sort of social sciences field would be able to discuss this in more mm -hmm. detail than we can. But there is definitely research looking at words, particularly words which divorce people from uh, a subject matter. I don't know if anyone's ever looked at it in a farming context. Yes. Well, of course, with fish, we say that we're harvesting fish. Yes. We don't say slaughtering. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all sorts of things we do. And of course, with companion animals, we say put to sleep rather than yeah. euthanize or, or cull. Um, so it's, yes, it is. It's full of euphemisms, isn't it? And then, Megan also brought up the really interesting fact the about the negative connotations as well. So she was talking about um, factory farming, which she'd picked up from somebody else in the thread. I can't remember. It was a Gigi. And I find factory farming to be a hugely emotive term. And when we're doing knowledge transfer, it's, it was a word I would never, ever use because I think you're immediately, as a scientist, I would be immediately pitting myself on the opposite side of the farmer. Mm -hmm. I want people in agriculture to see me as a friend, as someone that they can trust and someone who wants to help them, wants to help them help their animals. So I'm very, very uh, against using those negative emotional words. And that's possibly why I also use those protective words like mutilation and things like that, because I'm, I don't necessarily want the, want people to have those negative emotions when I'm trying to talk about animal welfare. I want to, Mm. cloak all of that mm. into a veneer of acceptability um, and whether or not it's always the right thing to do is very interesting. Well yeah topic. so let's take the word mutilation first so mutilation is actually the technical term for those sort of things that we do to so non so there's surgical procedures that are not for medical reasons yeah so things like ear tagging castration tail docking ear clipping in dogs um, all of those sort of things would come under the term mutilation Generally, so I say this is a, in EU legislation, yeah. that's what it's called, mutilation, yeah. that's what it's known as. And a farmer would know that as well. So they, they don't take that as a negative word in the same way as perhaps most of uh, you might because it's there in the, legisl uh, the legislation. So it's written into legislation. Mm. There are three main reasons for doing a mutilation. Mm. So one would be cosmetic, that it makes the animal look nicer. So this is often the way when we think of doing the ears for dogs and all those sort of things. There's no real reason for doing that. It's just to make them look in a certain fashion. And so that's a cosmetic reason. Then there's a reason for easing our processes along. So things like identification of an animal, so ear tagging or tattooing of ears in a laboratory situation. All of those type of mutilations are done to help us uh, with procedures. Castration could mm. probably be caught uh, under that terminology yeah, as well. It come under the, it, it's yeah. sort of a bit of a grey one yeah. really, but um, it, because uh, when we castrate our farm animals it's often because it makes them easier to handle or it's because it makes them not have uh, taint yeah. of maleness uh, in the meat. 
Um, but also when we talk about castrating our pet animals, it's because it's often for behavior reasons. So it's often, to, again, to ease us. But then there's also the third reason, which is to stop welfare problems. So things like beak trimming in, in laying hens or tail docking in pigs are to reduce behavioral problems and welfare problems in those animals. But of course, they are caused or are at least associated with the environment and the genetics of the animal. Um, so what we're doing by doing that mutilation is again masking the effects of environment and genetics yeah. uh, and so we're causing a pain uh, a painful procedure such as tail docking or, or beak trimming something that's long lasting as well um, because it's easier for us to do that than it is to change the environment or the genetics of the animal but it's, just, it's very uh, again another sort of one of these complicated issues where there's not necessarily a right answer in there mm. whether or not we should but that's the Be thing more where, blunt yeah, about the language tricky. or but well, that's the thing with factory because mm. um i put in one of the th threads that i don't like using the term factory farms either because i don't think it gives because it's so broad and i, I think mm. actually farms are very very different from one another in general but we went to the furnished cage place um to take the video they were they were fantastic they were very very good um uh, people who were working there really dedicated check those hens all the time 500,000 hens but it was the most near to a factory as you could possibly be yeah. feed mill at one side feed going in eggs birds laying eggs eggs going on a little conveyor belt into a room where they were packed into boxes and off to the supermarket mm -hmm. and all of that done in four hour periods which you know I think the definition of a factory is somewhere where it's very mechanized yeah. and that's pretty much what this facility yeah. was yeah. But, you know, they provided very good uh, care on the health of their birds. They were extremely low mortality rate, mm -hmm. very well inspected for the numbers, huge numbers of animals they had. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's pros and cons with both, I suppose. But yes, the factory thing, it's really tricky. It's yeah. funny, yeah. And I suppose as well, when we do uh, knowledge transfer like this, for things like the MOOC, we deliberately don't use words like uh, gimmer and uh, I think of guilt, he guilt, yeah. hair words which we know mm. members of the public don't necessarily understand. But I think sometimes we do forget as well that there is a whole host of language that mm. is very familiar to us and not familiar yeah. to other people. Yeah, because somebody, I think um, Deborah was asking about the term battery. Oh, yeah. Yeah. battery ends and of course we just sort of assume that everybody knows it which is crazy yeah. because yeah. why should they yeah. and so yes yeah, so hopefully we've answered Deborah's question by telling her what a battery cage is I, and, uh, I don't know if it was Deborah um, but somebody was also confused by our accents because it sounded like a buttery hen yeah. <laughs> as in <laughs> As in covered in butter. Covered in butter. Yes. <laughs> so it's battery, B A T T E R Y. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, I it's been a really useful comment to just make us think a little bit mm -hmm. about what we're using. But just coming back to the word mutilation, and a, as Sritha says, that is a you know that that is the term which is used within the EU legislation. Mm -hmm. I. I, I seem to think that that word is not liked within the states, but I was saying to her, I can't remember the word that is used in, instead, or there's a term which is used in, in, instead of mutilations. But um, I think just following up on maybe a bit from what Fritha was saying about the mutilation thing, and and, um, and you were describing all the different um, the different types of mutilations are reasons why we we might carry out mutilations, and I, I think it's probably important to stress that what we're we're describing these mutilations and what their purpose is, but also that you know, animal welfare research is is really focusing on ways to try and minimise the impact of these mutilations and looking for alternative methodologies. For example, things like immunocastration rather than surgical castration. So that involves it does involve still handling and two um, injections, but that that might be a way of preventing the actual need for you know, cutting and cutting uh, testes out without, you know, anaesthesia and analgesia. Um, so, and also thinking about the things, the reasons why we're carrying out these things, like tail docking. You know, why are we carrying out tail docking? We're carrying it out, out because our, ma our management and environment systems um, are, are not optimal for the pig and therefore they start to tail bite. So we, instead of just cutting their tails off when they're, you know, one to two days old, is actually thinking about, well, what what can we do to the environment to to change it to prevent the actual um, performance of tail biting? Any other examples that I'm just um, 
Well, I mean, it's the same with beach trimming. Beach exactly trimming, the same, yes. same beach thing. Trimming. So, yeah. although the law in the EU has changed so that you now have to use a hot iron, uh, officially, and the same with tail docking, actually, you are not supposed to carry out blanket tail docking or no. beach trimming anymore. No. But of course, farms do do this if they've got a history yes. of tail, mm. uh, tail yeah. biting or feather yeah. pecking yeah. in yeah. laying hens. Yeah. So, um, uh, it's trying to work out ways of improving the environment yeah. and in chickens and uh, laying hens particularly also thinking about the genetic basis uh -huh. of absolutely this is one of the things we touched on in the, the the pig session as well is that piglets are teeth clipped um to prevent sort of um a lot of uh, damage to the the cheeks of the piglets and to the to the sow mm -hmm. but that works in combination with the breeding because we've bred for such large litter sizes that there's much more competition at the udder to gain access to teats and then that results in fighting mm -hmm. and more damage to the cheeks so we think well okay well how can we we can we can reduce the need for teeth clipping by controlling litter size um in, in a much more you know efficient way um so you know yeah. thinking about the, the breeding the environment the management mm -hmm. how we can alter those to prevent the need for these mutilations in the first place is really and there's quite a bit of research going on currently to, to yeah. try and address yeah. some of these these questions but it's it's amazing really when you look across not just farm animals but all of the animals that we keep the number of things that we do mm, yeah. which are quite odd really when you look yeah. at them uh, out of context um, so yes, Very from, from clipping the ears of dogs to dyeing fish different colours and yeah, yeah. Uh, all sorts of things that we do to animals. Yeah. And yeah. uh, yes, that most of them are, are, are unnecessary. And those that are necessary, so probably like identification of, yeah. of cattle, for example, yeah. with an ear tag, that probably is quite a good thing for us to be able to trace uh, animals through the farming systems and in, onto slaughter. Um, so maybe we can find ways of minimizing the pain. Yeah. At that yeah. Point. And also the other uh, bizarre thing about the, the sort of legislation on, on mutilations is that you're allowed to do these procedures with it when the animal is very very young within a, you know maybe a, a dependent on the species a few days or a week or so on. so there's some sort of suggestion that somehow these very young animals are, are unable to experience pain mm -hmm. now it may be that, that that is the case or it may be that we just can't measure pain um, you know behavioral responses to pain or it may be that those young infants are less able to express painful behaviors so i think you know there's and, and and also we used to do quite a lot of pretty horrible procedures yeah. to infant baby children um that, that are no longer <laughs> it, yeah. allowed now, it might so. come under the category of not having looked properly yeah not having yes. actually done the research yes. well enough yeah. to be able to say that yeah because yeah, um there was some um, lots and lots of research done on lamb castration so we we actually yeah. do know that yes. that's very very yes. painful for lambs yes. um so that is an area which has been very very thor thoroughly yeah. researched um so you know it, it, we know that young or old yeah uh they still react very very strongly to being castrated as you can imagine yeah. um but that the older ones the, the 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 only real difference between the older ones and the younger ones is the amount of damage the tissue damage mm. and the tissue damage is last lasts, lasts for longer, longer. Yeah. in the older animals yeah. um, but from the behavioral point of view they reacted exactly the same and of course the young yeah. animals when they were writhing around I'm not going to be mincing my words here, but they do writhe around yeah, yeah. once you um, uh, uh, take their testicles off with some device or other. If um, you're not using pain relief. If you're not yeah. using pain relief, which most farmers won't, yeah. um, that they then take in less colostrum. Mm. Yeah, And colostrum being the first milk, which is very exactly. important. And it's yeah. very important from an immune point of view. So if you reduce the immune uh possibilities immune function possibilities from yeah. a very low yeah, yeah, a very yeah. early age then you're going to increase mm. the problems with yeah. lamb mortality well and also given that you've damaged part of the animal's body <laughs> so if their immune system is suppressed through you know lack of or re reduced colostrum intake in addition to having potentially an open sore Wound. whether it be the tail yeah. cut off or ear notching or some sort of damage then which is a you know a site for infection then the animal mm. can be compromised yeah so, yay we're talking about depressing things should we go yeah. something well, slightly lighter about, yeah, if, or do you want to leave that one to the um it's the, it's the yeah, yeah, traditional yeah. thing yeah we could do it all 
Um, we also have some questions really, on here. Yes, as well. we do, but we, we maybe need to talk about sex semen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll talk about the fish. But... Fair enough. Well, we had quite a few questions, and again, there was one on a thread about the beef ban in India and all of the implications for that mm -hmm. about uh, reducing the often male animals that are not useful in a an economic sense so these animals that are produced because they just are produced naturally 50 percent say of the animals that are born or hatched that are then not needed mm -hmm. um, from a dairy cow point of view uh, obviously 50 percent roughly 50 percent of all the calves that are born and a calf has to be born for the cow to lactate so a calf that is born a male and if they are of a dairy breed then they are especially holsteins they are they are oh, in fact actually especially jerseys <laughs> jerseys yeah. are the worst uh, from this point of view but dairy breeds are then more difficult to sell on as beef animals because they take more food to get them to a point when they are able to go to slaughter in times where the beef price is low which in the uk at the moment is the opposite it's very high at the moment um those animals are worthless from the farmer's point of view and that it would cost them more to get them to the point where they can sell them than they would get money back and so at that point they are more likely to be uh shot at birth which is very sad and farmers really really hate doing that um, so there are lots of different ways around that. One of them is to uh, have them be sold for beef like they are at the moment because I say the beef price in the UK is very high so they, they are worth something to, to the farmer. You can also sell them into the veal industry. Mm -hmm. In the UK veal industry is um, uh, suppressed, is yes. suppressed <laughs> but is growing in a it's called rose veal or rose veal yeah. isn't it where they have them in in large straw bedded group housed um facilities as opposed to traditional veal crates because that's illegal in the uh, eu just now um, since 1990 something mm -hmm. um and i think possibly two thousand I can't remember. Um, and uh so yes yeah, so that you could sell them into the veal or you could not produce them in the first place which brings us to sex semen so it is possible to choose only those sperm that would make a female animal and it's relatively easy to do this and then to provide because most dairy cows are um, bred by artificial insemination so they don't go anywhere near a bull themselves so the farmer will receive packs straws of semen and those semen could be sex semen so they can only produce a female calf so that seems to be a really good answer doesn't it to um producing all these male animals that there is no need for and that that might have suffer welfare problems or ethical problems of being mm. shot at birth the only problem with sex semen is that it has a much lower fertility rate in dairy cattle um, than normal semen and that means that uh, it's also very expensive mm. so it means that um you might only try and use it on your best cows or you might um try and use it only on your first lactation animals so your heifers your, your young cows uh, rather than trying to use it on the whole herd because it would just be very very um, mm. expensive whether the cost will come down of sex semen and more farmers will use it is, a, is another matter. But we were discussing whether this would be an option in India where there's a huge dairy industry, but not very much of a beef industry, mm -hmm. although they do export quite a lot of beef. Um, but uh, there are certain states where beef has now been banned. And we were saying, well, the calves are still being produced because there's a huge dairy industry. What do you do with those calves? Some of them just die because they're not looked after others that are then relate, released onto the street to fend for themselves and that's not necessarily very good either yeah. um so perhaps sex semen in that type of environment would be great the problem is the expense yeah. and so whether we can do it on a on a cheaper uh, yeah. basis so the, the good thing about sex semen is that it doesn't involve any hormonal treatments or anything else you you basically create an environment where the female sperm can live better than the male sperm mm. and you can filter them out from one another. So um, so uh, I did meet a farmer once who won a prize at his local agricultural show, which was 
free sex semen for a year, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is a great prize for a dairy farmer, obviously. Um, but anyway, do you want to go on to uh, fish? Yeah, well, um, I guess just just to mention an, another way of of um, of influencing the, the the sex of the progeny is in is in the fish industry where um the, the the fish that are obviously grown and that we eat are are generally all female and and that is um because they that you don't get the same behavioral issues that you would have if you have male fish within the tank because they're, they're slower growing so they are in the tanks for longer longer periods of time and obviously you don't want them to reproduce and there's lots mm -hmm. of aggression if there's um lots of males in the in the tank so so the development of fish is, is obviously quite a bit different to mammalian species but basically the, the, the when the brood fish are being developed um, the um, there's a hormone treatment used so that for the the male fish producing the sperm that they only produce X sperm um, so that all of the progeny will be XX they'll all be female um, so this is kind of done within the industry but really we don't know very much about um, the effect of these hormone treatments on, on the fish to develop so that they then produce um, X sperm. It's another use of, um, it's another type of technology I guess mm -hmm. to try and minimise um, or influence the gender of the progeny um, but I think we do need to be a bit careful about the, infl the, the effect of these types of technology on, on the animals that are undergoing the treatment. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> and somebody in, somebody in the forums was saying, why do we not do this for um, laying hens? Because the male laying yeah. hens are a waste product to that. Uh, there's a couple of difficulties there. As you remember from uh, Vicky Sandilin's video, uh, when we're breeding laying hens, we actually have a system where the male is in with the female, so we don't use artificial insemination. Mm -hmm. Birds also don't have the XX for females and XY for males. Instead, it's ZW for females and WW for mm -hmm. males. Yeah. Um, so sexing it's the other way around. It's the other way around. So the, the heterozygote is the male and no, the heterozygote female. is the female and yeah. the homozygote yeah. is the male. Right. Um, so sexing that, even if you could, would be even more difficult. And artificial insemination isn't really used in many birds. Turkeys. 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 Yeah. Is it? Turkeys. Yeah. yeah. Turkeys that can't mount females because they're yeah, too, so big. too big. Yeah. Just talking about all the dodgy subjects today. I know. It's a very exciting hangout, <laughs> this one. Um but yeah, so that's kind of why we don't why it's not been developed yet within um laying hens. And the easiest way to do that, or the sort of the most promising route would be to identify which eggs are male and not have those eggs proceed. Mm -hmm into hatching and also some people were asking there was somebody on the discussion board who was asking but why don't we uh take the males and use them mm. either for food for humans or for pet food why don't we grow them on sorry to use the term growing again raise them <laughs> why, don't we, uh, yeah. why don't we raise our male laying hen chicks mm. layers chicks um to be a meat product and the reason is because they've been bred the the laying hens have been pre bred to produce eggs they've not been bred to be produce meat yeah. so they don't grow at the same speed by any means as a as a broiler chicken they don't have very much meat on them they're quite scrawny looking things um, and although they do reach sexual maturity much um, younger than uh, the wild type birds it's nowhere near as as um, fast as, as uh, mm. the broiler chicken it's actually in some ways quite similar with the, the dairy and there's these sort of divergent sort of ways of, mm. of producing animals and that the beef and dairy industry don't Really, you know, the dairy calves are not yeah. great for beef production. Mm -hmm. Similar with the the meat and egg um, chickens, that the these males that come from the egg industry are not great at producing mm -hmm. for meat production. Mm -hmm. So it's been sort of, and this is breeding. This is, you know, the, <laughs> they've been bred for different mm -hmm. traits, so mm -hmm. they're not good at transferring yeah. between the different yeah. systems anymore. And because broiler chickens are basically so cheap to raise, they, I mean, they really are cheap, it's less than 10 cents a bird. Mm -hmm. It's what they're worth at the end of their raising period. You know, it's only taken 10 cents to raise that one chicken. 
Um, so you can see that there's a, an enormous amount of uh, feed goes in and all of that, but actually per bird, they cost very little to, to raise, whereas it costs an awful lot more to raise the male chicks. Yeah. So you can get so much more from your broiler chicken for less money, that those male laying chicks are worth nothing they're not even and so people keep asking why can't they use, be used for pet food because it's cheaper to use the broiler chickens for pet food mm -hmm. um, and that's just the way it is they are when they have been dispatched uh that's another euphemistic term they yeah. go um, dispatched, dispatched yeah. yeah they um are used sometimes in pet foods for exotic pets the huge majority are i'm afraid are used for fertilizers and yeah. such yeah, but this is uh, sometimes we're quite often asked as well, why do we keep using economic arguments? This is the reason because it is an industry that runs on economics. Mm -hmm. And if we can make a convincing welfare argument with economics backing us, we're more likely to be uh, taken up on that. Yeah, because somebody commented, I can't remember who it was, about the, the link between animal welfare science and industry. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we were talking about the fact that if, if, if we can, through evidence, show that particular practice is an improvement for animal welfare, but also as an improvement for production, and for, then that's a, a kind of win-win situation, mm -hmm. if you like. And, mm -hmm. and and you know we are having to work with the industry and try and, and um, improve things within that system, and the and the economic and political and all the other pressures that the industry mm -hmm. are are dealing with. That we have to we try and and, mm -hmm. and make suggestions which are going to be appropriate within that that particular situation so we really do have to consider you know the economics and the politics and the environmental issues which i know have come up a few times as yes. well this week um that that whole sort of global context the interesting thing is though especially within um emerging economies and developing mm -hmm. countries uh, when you do make relatively simple animal welfare changes, animal welfare positive changes in, in industry, there is an economic return. Yes. Yeah. And um, it can increase productivity. Yes. And so it is much easier to talk about win-wins. It becomes harder in, say, a country like the UK where those gains have already been made. Yeah. Um, and so you're making very small changes. You're yeah. also making it within an expensive environment. So it's very difficult to make large-scale uh, capital changes like building a new building for yeah, your yeah, eggs yeah. costs a huge amount of money in the UK, whereas it maybe costs less money, say, in China than it would here. Yeah, yeah. So we have some questions Should coming on here. That one. Sort of is that the bar barriers sort to of, change? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but yes, and the hunger one, yes, and maybe one here. Should we go for one here and then these, these ones? Two. Okay. Okay, so what do we like on the questions and answers we've got? <laughs> I could very, very quickly do the one about the exotics. Okay. Uh, where am I seeing this that? One, this, one. this one? Yeah. Let's do this one. So this is from Rob Russell, who's asking, in the UK, when we uh, talk about the welfare of production animals, we generally mean cattle, swine, chickens, and sheep. What is the situation in terms of welfare for things such as ostrich farms or other species we in the UK would regard as exotic? Mm. Well, well ostrich farming went through a huge boom a few yeah. years ago mm. and then completely collapsed. And I think there's only one or two farms yeah. left in the whole of the UK. So um, it's really not a big deal anymore. But there are. Uh, uh, alpaca farms, ostriches, a yeah. uh, couple, uh, wild boar, mm -hmm. other such things like mm -hmm. that. They are all covered a kangaroo in yeah uh -huh, in legislation. Um, there are welfare codes produced by the government for exotic farm species. So it's it, it's exactly the same yep. sort of deal, really. There's an awful lot less science done on those exotic species than there are on the more common species. Oh. But uh, yeah, no, I was going to say uh, um, the Humane Slaughter Association did quite a bit on slaughter of exotics of ostriches. Or, yeah, ostriches and also and um, there was other yeah species. deer obviously is a deer, big, quite yeah. a big deal here in scotland mm. and uh slaughter and or um farming of deer in general mm -hmm. rather than shooting of wild deer or semi-wild mm -hmm. deer on hills uh so yes it's a it's an important topic it's definitely covered in the legislation the government have to produce welfare codes for all farm species whether or not there's two farms or whether there's 200 um and uh, but the level of science um that's carried out on these exotic species is, is much lower generally because obviously the yeah there isn't the funding necessarily there to do it yeah um but, but they would like to they would still come under the, um, the legislature yeah, and the various and farm and animal welfare you know, having a duty of care and i have to say if anybody does have a an ostrich farm or anything like that and they want somebody to do welfare assessment we have loads of students <laughs> and we would I'll, I'll happily i'd quite happy to do an alpaca yeah study. we would happily come and come and do some welfare assessment for you we'd be really interested yeah. in that yeah. 
Yeah. So that's a quick one, but are there ones that are maybe uh, a little bit more? Ooh, certification schemes. That's a hard one. Should we go for that one? Yeah, okay. It's, or, uh, we've it's, got... it's fine, we can do that. Uh, oh, there's, oh, well, that's just that one. Sorry, I'm pointing, which is silly. Um, <laughs> this one? No, no, not this that one? one. That one. That one. Just That's just somebody pointing out. Uh, so, do you want to click that one from Sorry, there? There we go. So Rio uh, says male la layer chicks are being used as meat in Indonesia. This typical less bulky meat is very high demand for our consumers. I think introducing this layer meat to the consumers might make millions of chicks be at least useful in the world. Absolutely. Mm, yeah, and in agree. fact, of I course, uh, different cultures have different. We, we have this weird mm. thing where we want these enormous um, huge muscled birds uh the broiler chickens with their enormous breast meat yes. and massive legs and all of this mm. and the same with turkeys whereas actually in lots of countries they do want a smaller bird or a bird that has a different type of meat quality from mm. the broiler chickens yeah so thank you Rhea. that was really a um, really good point. point yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry for pointing <laughs> <laughs> we can see the questions on the side, side. here so yeah. Um, so I talk about this while you're yeah. yeah, why not? Okay, so there was a question um, from Richard Brown or a comment about um, freedom from hunger. And it kind of got us thinking a little bit about this freedom from particular uh, things. Um, so freedom from pain, fear and distress and so on. And, and actually that, that, that there may be some benefit, if you like, to experiencing um, some negative experiences um, in terms of increasing I suppose the complexity of, of our lives for example if we're always free from stress then what does that mean for us we're all, or we're always you know we have a lack of you know stimulation and range of experiences um, so I was, I was thinking about this in terms of you know obviously freedom from from hunger but I think probably as, as Frith and I discussed before this the the main sort of issues with when we talk about hunger um, in a sort of production environment is it tends to be chronic Mm. for the animals involved so it tends to be over a long period of time and that there's often you know different to ourselves if we feel hungry we you know can eat although of course that's not the case for the, the, the population throughout the world but that animals have, have they don't have the ability to control that they, they they obviously can just eat when when food is provided to them so so there's issues with cr chronic hunger and control of that that situation and of course this is all exacerbated by our um, use of sort of uh, low quantity high quality food stuffs um, to, to feed animals and this is you know even if animals are ad-lib they're more likely to receive a sort of high quality low quantity food and it's particularly an issue in the feed restricted animals like the broiler breeders and the pregnant sows who are genetically selected for high growth rate but we don't want them to grow that fast so we restrict their their feed intake but generally there's a there is you know the 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 industry provides these kind of high quality foods and of course there's there's reasons for that um and we have touched on environmental issues throughout the throughout the week um and you know we do need to think a little bit about the generally the impact of providing these types of diets to animals because obviously it's from an environmental point of view, uh, when you consider the transportation of food and so on, that it makes sense from an environmental point of view to, to, to transport low quantities of high quality foods. But we do need to think a little bit about how that interacts with the experience of hunger in animals in production systems and particularly those which are experiencing food restriction because mm -hmm. of the genetic selection um, that they've been, the reasons why they've been bred. Yeah. I think in general, really? any sort of acute stress, and by that we mean something which is something bad for a short period of time, by a short period of time which can be very short, is easily recoverable from. Mm. And on a long-term welfare uh, scale is not necessarily a hugely bad thing. When you have many acute stresses mm. or a chronic stress where there is a sort of a background level of stress which just happens all the time, that's when you start to see the really big welfare problems and particularly in production animals the really big impacts on production as well so anything that happens for a short period of time and it only happens rarely isn't quite so worrying as the as the many repeated stresses 
or the long-term constant stresses. Mm -hmm. Uh, just touching there on the environmental issue, <laughs> there were a few people who were saying things about the um, large scale, more intensive farming and how unsustainable that is. Um, and although uh, I agree that just building bigger and bigger farms is not necessarily a way forward, one of the things we do have to bear in mind um, from a climate change point of view is if you do the studies, although sometimes I wonder about the full life cycle and the full, full mm -hmm. you know, every mm -hmm. single Such element that goes system, into yeah. a farm, but if you, if you have a big farm producing 50,000 broiler chickens, you are pu putting far less energy into those birds and getting out far less yes, pollution in, yeah. a, in, a, in a carbon footprint point of view part of them um, point of view than you would do if you had lots and lots of smaller farms yeah. um, and so pigs and poultry particularly have sh been shown to be very environmentally efficient from a carbon footprint in their locality they might actually be quite polluting from a carbon footprint point of view yeah. they are much more efficient than beef cattle which take quite a long time to grow or um, then then lots of small farms and that might seem quite counterproductive to us and does in fact seem counterproductive because because um, sometimes it feels like a step backwards in terms mm. of animal welfare and that's yeah. I think it's quite important that uh, animal welfare scientists are at the table um, when we're you know when we're talking in governmental groups and all of those sort of things because if you have an environmental lobby a food lobby and a government group then then it's quite possible that nobody's fighting on the side of animal welfare yeah. within that. Yeah. So um, it's quite an important point, but it is slightly counterproductive than uh, than what you'd not counterproductive, yeah. counterintuitive, counterintuitive. Yeah. from what you would think yeah. um, on the sustainability thing. So there, yeah. there is this whole idea of sustainable intensification yeah. which yeah. is a really tricky topic and probably not one we can cover in this introduction course but just to bear in mind that if you're actually producing a broiler chicken in a in a big farm with lots and lots of chickens it's it's more environmentally uh sound than yeah. it is have mm. lots of little fun which might sound very odd mm. yeah. and there's probably something to be said as well for sustainable consumership as well yes <laughs> and yes. trying to encourage consumers to move towards purchasing habits which reflect sustainability throughout their entire shopping bag mm. regardless of whether they're using animal products um vegetable products everything really there needs to I think consumers really need to think about that. Somebody said in the forums, should we tax high greenhouse farm production? No, well, they said, should we tax factory farms? Oh, that was it. And I was thinking, well, it would if you were taxing the highest carbon footprint, then you would tax the smaller farms, yeah. or the medium farms, actually. And the, the medium farms and, are the ones that and are most the, And the better welfare farms. Yeah, in so many it, it's, it is counterintuitive from what you'd think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the most... Uh, environmentally sound as we said from a local point of no. view it's purely from the carbon footprint point yeah. of view which yeah. of course so much environmental science is now building. yes and there's also a lot of interesting work looking at what actually contributes to a carbon footprint so for example if you are buying stuff from across the world is that actually a smaller carbon footprint than uh, buying locally because sometimes the local production is less efficient yes so you know uh, maybe it is better to buy the apples from New Zealand than yeah, the yeah. apples from down the road yeah, yeah. but it's slightly <sighs> beyond our remit yes yes <laughs> Um, yeah, I think maybe we're gonna. Yeah, have to I think it's time for our final soon question. because it's three o'clock. But we've got lots and lots of questions on the on the board here on the side of our little video bit. Um, so maybe we can try and uh, uh, get some of those answered on the discussion boards yeah. over the next week. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so don't feel like we're not going to answer your question. But I wanted to answer um, Yvonne Robson's question. Um, she put a very good post on the Hangout board all about her work that she's done in, in less developed countries, mm -hmm. um, working with people and with animals as she's a, she's a veterinarian herself. Um, and uh, she was asking about, what well, she was saying about, uh, although in say, more developed countries, for example, the UK, a lot of people are very mm. divorced from their food products. So they buy um, some sausages in a pack, which is, you know, uh, uh, cellophane wrapped, and they never have to think about the pig in, you know, that has made that or the, the mother pig that has given birth to mm. the, the pig that we eat. 
Um, they don't have to think about that. They don't have to think about the slaughter because it happens behind closed doors mm. and we don't have to, it's just yeah. ignorance is bliss. Yeah. But then you get to the other side where you have, say, in, in particularly in poor countries where there might be um, a slaughter happening all around in a, say in a, in a rural village where um, mm. animals could be slaughtered in a very uh, inhumane, unhumane, inhumane type of way. <laughs> In. Um, <laughs> and that people become desensitized to that um, and you know obviously because there's problems with poverty in the human population as well uh, and so it's really really difficult so Yvonne was had a very good post I thought it was really really interesting what she was saying but she also asked quite a lot of questions <laughs> um, but they are questions that are quite close to uh, well all of us because we all work in animal welfare education but I thought mm -hmm. we'd try and maybe answer them so Yvonne asked have animal welfare scientists included the effects of educating people mm -hmm. in their work in uh, animal welfare? Hmm. <laughs> so the answer is yes, they have. Uh, we've done quite a few studies ourselves recently. Um, mm. With uh, so we've been funded by the European Union in a project called Animal Welfare Indicators, which you've probably seen quite a lot of uh, links to during the MOOC course. And one major part of that project was looking at education yeah. and, pr and producing educational resources for a variety of groups of people from the public to farmers to school children to scientists so um, yeah producing mm. educational materials so we've done quite a lot of educational materials for veterinary students and we're quite good at that um, we're quite good <laughs> at uh, providing materials that increase learning that change attitudes we don't know the long term change, but we certainly know that short term wise, several weeks after uh, giving the learning mm. that those vet stu students still retain that information and still have had their attitudes changed um, in, in key areas. And actually one of the key areas was looking at castration and yeah. other mutilations. Mm. So it fits in nicely with what we were saying earlier. When we try and produce educational materials for other groups, now bear in mind veterinary students are, are usually tip top and are very, very good, good at learning. learning. <laughs> uh, when we try and give educational materials to other groups, we're less good at it. Um, uh, although hopefully we'll learn lots of stuff from the MOOC course here, yeah. uh, but it is really, really difficult, particularly to get to be able to educate farmers. Mm. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, probably far too many to go into there's the sort of slightly stuck in the ways I've always done it like this this yeah. is how the traditional yeah. view of um, farming so there's a sort of barrier to uptake of that information because my father's done it like this my grandfather's done it like this why should I have to change it it's worked for them it worked for me and um, so that could be quite tricky to overcome mm -hmm. uh, there's also um, language issues so as you've already seen we tend to use jargon, jargon. And so we do use farm jargon, which the farmers, of course, know, but we also sometimes use science jargon. And so, for example, we would use the term aversive. I don't know how many of you know what the term aversive means, uh, but it means something that the animal doesn't want to, oh, yeah, doesn't, doesn't like, like, doesn't want to do, doesn't, you know, is, is unpleasant to them. And we tested some materials that we'd made specifically for sheep farmers. On we tried really hard last year and we had the word aversive in it and none of the farmers mm -hmm. in the focus group knew what that meant so it's back to the drawing board and, and really try and understand the group that you're educating yeah. before yeah. <laughs> producing the materials <laughs> but we thought we'd done it but we obviously hadn't done it well enough <laughs> so the answer is yes that we definitely have tried to uh, educate people and in, in different groups and there's been quite a lot of work than this and i will post up some papers yes. um some of the recent papers if on so and everybody so you can see those in the hangout post thread is it po uh, possible to accurately assess the educational effect that is a tricky question, mm. my goodness. So as we said, we've, we've tried to assess learning by um, giving uh, students or the farmers or whatever group we're looking at a, a questionnaire about their knowledge and their attitudes and their empathy levels and all of those sort of things before producing educational materials, then getting them to do educational materials. So we often do something that's quite an interactive, yeah. online interactive stuff like the things you've been doing um, on the MOOC versus uh, uh, traditional learning, which would be something that you have to read, for example, versus nothing. Mm. And then read, so, so there'll be three different groups of people. 
who get these different types of materials, then re-ask the same sort of questions that we'd asked in the first questionnaire mm. to see if, if there are changes in uh, uh, knowledge, attitudes, empathy, and that sort of thing. And also ask how they found the learning materials. Mm -hmm. And then a few weeks later, try and ask the same questions again. Yeah. And um, so we, we're at least been able to see whether there's an immediate change and then whether there's some long-term yeah. change. But what we don't know is how long is that long-term change because we are only looking at four to six weeks after the event. And also we don't know whether that affects their behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that affecting behavior which is the most <laughs> important bit, yeah. which we, it's really hard to measure. It is very hard. And I think as well, there's another thing to be said for one of the things I'm very interested in is what we call informal science education. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit like MOOCs, but it's things where um, people actively seek out more information and they interact with that information in a somewhat passive or more entertainment type manner, mm -hmm. rather than the kind of objects that we've been designing with the Animal Welfare Indicators Project is very um, targeted at a certain group and it's very much... Uh, developed for a certain reason whereas sometimes with more informal uh, lessons you're trying to get across extremely simple messages um, and just trying to engage people and people come to that with different wants they want some people want to be entertained some people uh, for example doing the MOOC some people want the certificate or the signature track certificate uh, some people just want to find out more and some people don't really know what they want when they go into a MOOC and so one of the things uh, we have done with the first one in the MOOC is we looked at whether or not people enjoyed it. And yes, people seem to enjoy it. We asked people, did it improve your, or do you think it's improved your personal life? And do you think it's improved your uh, professional life? And personal life, I don't mean anything silly. I don't know why you're <laughs> sniggering there, brother. Um, <laughs> and uh, people responded positively to those questions. We had knowledge-based questions and we had attitude-based questions as well. So we were trying to sort of get at this from a very full perspective. But again, we were only able to do that within the short term. So there are lots of projects looking at this. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a couple of very interesting projects looking at uh, teenagers, which is a very important group to target. If you can set those behaviour patterns quite early on, Hopefully they'll uh, carry on for longer um, and definitely something that we should be doing more of. I think it's quite important to mention as well, SRUC, Scotland Royal College and the University of Edinburgh together as an agricultural group where uh, recently our UK government looks at how what the impact of all of our sciences. Uh, we were rated as very highly, in fact, the top agricultural um, uh, sort of group. Uh, for translating our science into stuff that actually makes a difference. So we're very keen on on trying to evaluate how do we do that and how do we do it well. Um, I suppose yeah. the final thing to say is that we do know that our sort of more formal, long-scale education mm. does work and does make a difference yeah. um, because we've been running an MSc course for 25 <laughs> yeah. years. Yeah. Um, Susan hasn't been doing it for all 25 no, years. No, I haven't. Right no. Year, but uh, <laughs> the course itself has run for that long, that yeah. programme, and um, we know the numbers of people who've gone through that programme who are doing active work yeah. in animal welfare, yeah. be it in non-governmental organisations, in governments, and in science yeah. across the world. So yeah. uh, education can make a difference. So Yvonne, her last question was, might this achieve more than legislation? Sometimes it has to go hand in hand. Yes. Uh, so sometimes um, education can have a great impact, but it, we're really only just beginning to know whether these sort of more smaller scale and targeted education uh, packages can really really make a difference in the mm. long term mm. but hopefully they can because I think you know that's the way to get information across to people and yeah. also it's not just we're teaching you but to do it in a very interactive manner where people yeah. can actually inform us as well like you've been doing yeah. over the course of the discussion <laughs> because we've already learned something today about uh, Indonesia and the yeah. male meat chickens and so, how we use terminology and how well. we use terminology and all of those things so fantastic it's yeah. uh, it's amazing how much we can get in um, from you guys as well as yeah. us giving to you. Yeah. So I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Yes, because we have a lot. <laughs> well, uh, we've run slightly over time, but thank you very much for staying with us. And do remember, if you are watching this on YouTube and you like what you see, do like, share and subscribe mm -hmm. to the Jean Marchique YouTube channel because then YouTube will start promoting our videos to other people as well. So the best will get out further. And we will see you next week for Heather Bacon's 
uh, week on captive wild animal welfare and we will have a hangout that week as well and we are very well we're coming up to the end of the MOOC so next week is the last week that has a test attached to it um, the week after that is an optional extra week so we do hope that you stick around we're very much enjoying the process and we will see you then so bye bye bye, bye. <laughs>